today's guests are Janice and James Prochaska. James Prochaska is one of the most cited psychologists of all time. He has recently been recognized as one of the most preeminent living clinical psychologists. And he is famous for developing with colleagues the stages of change model, which we will be talking about today. Janice Prochaska is his wife, and she is one of the most published authors in social work. And she has been applying the stages of change model in various contexts, for example, organizational ones. So today we'll, we'll be talking about their book, Changing to Thrive, which came out in 2016, and which I highly recommend reading and buying and then reading. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoy the conversation and have fun. Okay, so Janice and James Prochaska, welcome to the Painting Onions podcast. Thank you so uh, much for um, getting your time to, to have this conversation with me. We're glad to be doing it with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, it's especially with the international audience. Right, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so I read your book, Changing to Thrive, and the subtitle is called Using the stages of change to overcome the top threats to your health and happiness. And my first question is, what are those top threats to our health and happiness? Okay. Uh, with the uh, health, uh, it's uh, smoking, alcohol misuse, unhealthy diets, uh, inadequate sleep, uh, and stress and uh, distress. And inadequate exercise. Oh, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, like I said, I read your book and it's uh, remarkable how many benefits um, there are. I think you list like for each of those 50, 60, even 70 benefits for exercising regularly, eating healthy, stop smoking and so on. Um, another question that I have is if I want to change, let's say, any behavior, is the stages of change model that we will be talking about in a moment, is it applicable to all kinds of behavior or just those that are similar to those you just described? It's been used in many, many behaviors, including bullying prevention, domestic violence, adherence to medications, uh, and even informally with, with couples saying, I'm ready to buy a couch, but my husband's not. How can I move him to be prepared to go out couch shopping? <laughs> All right. The worst problem with couples is uh, you know, when it comes to blaming, it goes like this. You know, each one's blaming the other one. Uh, but I would also ask Janice, actually, who's uh, done the leading work on applying the model to organizational change. Mm -hmm. I think the real trick when you use it with different kinds of behaviors is to be very clear at the beginning as what would the person be doing if they were in action? What would they be doing behaviorally if they were in action? Like actually stopping smoking, mm -hmm. actually taking the medication regularly as prescribed. And then you go through the stages working to get them to be in action, doing the behavior in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to add, just to add uh, at a national conference of our uh, Division of Health Services, uh, um, after presenting, one of the experts said, well, You have a universal model, meaning it applies to all types of uh, thought, big range of behaviors. Mm -hmm. And I think that's good to know because. Well, some people may say, well, I, I don't smoke, I don't drink. Sure, I want to eat healthy and stuff like that. But then they um, come up with different behaviors and want to change them. And then it's good for them to know that the stages of change model is going to help them as well. Um, so let's talk about those stages of change. Um, could you maybe contrast the stages of change model with the um, action model of change that so many people um, have in their mind when they think of changing? Well, um, the action model assumes that somebody is ready to take action, you know, right away. And we certainly have uh, heard complaints from patients that their doctor says, you have to quit smoking. 
And the patient says, I know how, but tell me how I can. I know, mm. I know that I know why, but tell me how I can. Yeah. Yeah. I think also the therapist is in the action model says, this is what you need to do, do it. Mm -hmm. Rather than recognizing that the individual may be at a different stage of readiness to actually do the healthy behavior. Yeah, so do it ready or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think I told you that I'm in training for becoming a psychotherapist for youth, so children and adolescents. And I think that's also uh, critical because I thought about this and um, oftentimes we hear that parents want their children to change, but the children aren't necessarily ready for action or something like that. So the clinician really needs to know um, at what stage the child or adolescent is um, in order to help them progress to the next stage because, um, well, um, well, before I ask the, the next question, like how you move from one stage to another, could you maybe go through each of the stages for a second so the audience will better understand what kind of stages we are talking about? Well, let me just first say about adolescence. Mm -hmm. you know, when, when parents say you have to get good grades, you know, I have to get better friends, you know, the, the uh, youngster experienced that as coercion. Whereas, let's talk about what the benefits might be from, you know, working more in school and for your future. Yeah. Yeah. So, so. so describe the stages of change. Okay. So, uh, the first stage is uh, what we call pre-contemplation. Mm -hmm. uh, that they uh, are typically in denial that their uh, drinking is a problem. They're Uh, smoking is a problem, uh, eating, uh, but also uh, one of the real problems is when they said, well, the only way I can change is to take action, they become demoralized because they take action and they fail, they take mm -hmm. action and they fail, and then they give up, I can't change. Well, the factor is, I don't know how to change. Mm -hmm. And then what's the next stage? So after pre-contemplation? Contemplation. Yeah, well, with the contemplation. And, mm. uh, the profile there for people who have pro progressed from pre-contemplation to contemplation is that the pros of changing have gone up and the cons of changing have come down. Or if we use other languages, the benefits have gone up and the costs have gone down mm -hmm. but in contemplation the person is starting to think that maybe i need to live a little differently and maybe i need to work on doing the healthier behavior but there still can be a lot of ambivalence because the pros and cons can be kind of like in, uh, uh, even with each other mm -hmm. and the work of the therapist here or, or the helper is to help reduce some of the cons so that it's easier to see that the pros really are stronger and, and would help them better. Mm -hmm. Well, with the therapists, uh, you know, they need to understand that if they're trying to pressure somebody to uh, take action, uh, it might demoralize them, but worse, they might drop out. And we know there's a high percentage of patients that drop out early. Yeah. I think, um, and I like your motto, it's um, wherever you're at, we can work with that, I think. And I think- Wherever really you're at, yes, we yeah, can work and, with that. Yes, and I think it really um, gets to this point. And I mean, in a way, it sounds like me, it's also way better for prevention because um, people who maybe want to change but don't feel ready, maybe are discouraged if they think, well, If I go to this type of therapist or doctor or something, they really want me to change, but I'm, I'm not ready yet. So when your model says, I, I take you where you're at and let's try to move from there. And that's what I really like about um, the model. So we have pre-contemplation, not ready, either by, by being demoralized or just not wanting to change maybe. Then contemplation, you are getting ready, but you're kind of ambivalent as you called it. And, and what's the next stage? How it's the next stage called? Uh, preparation, where uh, 
we measured as you're intending to take action in the next 30 days. Mm. And, so, uh, and, and, and it's respecting where they're at. And they're going to be much more likely to take the action and uh, they'll not demoralize themselves right away. So in this stage, it's important for the, the therapist to help them take some small steps towards action so they can gain some confidence. Also to make a commitment of when they think that they would be ready to take stronger action in the healthier behavior and also give some supportive help for them to be able to do that and really encourage preparation because once you go to action, it's a lot of work. And if there's some good preparation, hopefully you can stay in action. Yeah, that makes sense. So, and then the action phase is like doing the thing you want to do. And then um, there's maintenance, which I think you define really like, um, I think after six months of action, right? And then there's the last stage termination, which I guess is really depends on what kind you are um, talking about. I actually, and maybe I will um, tell you a little story about that. I was a smoker and I really like um, kept dreaming about smoking. I still, I think today it's like 10 years ago. If I think how it feels like to smoke, I, I think I would enjoy it. Um, and it's still in my head a way, but I think you have, you talk in the book about like a five year um, limit that oftentimes is like the limitation mark um could you comment on that is is it like i think you said something like it's from cancer research or something like an analogy or so well the, the uh, important thing about maintenance is uh, termination oh termination mm. okay is that our habits like smoking like alcohol uh, uh, misuse they get hardwired in Right, so they're hardwired in your brain, mm -hmm. and it takes time to take and uh, to have a new pathway in your brain. Uh, example is the famous golfer uh, Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. Mm -hmm. Okay, he had, he, knew he had to change his uh, swing. Uh, swing, and so he would do hit a thousand balls a day. This new method, thousand balls a day. So it was hardwired in, it was automatic. Mm. He didn't have to worry about you know, hitting it into the sand trap. Yeah. I think your point and with termination, it, it, it doesn't happen for all behaviors. And it's interesting, 10 years later, you know, you're still dreaming and, mm. and wishing for some of that uh, pleasure of the taste. So some behaviors, they, you have to keep staying in maintenance for them rather than reach that termination. I think with our daughter, she runs every day. And, and I think that she's in termination for having to regular exercise. She just is just part of her life. And she knows that she needs to do that for mm. stress reduction as well. Yeah. But there are, are, there are some times where you're going to slip, uh, but not necessarily, you, you don't have to fail. Mm. Yeah, and that's another thing you're talking about in the book. So um, you talk about like a spiral, That means that you can always, or maybe it's even natural to slip back, so to speak. And I think in Germany, I don't know if you have it in America, we have a, a saying that it's, well, okay, you might go, um, you step back, but maybe you're just um, <laughs> taking, taking um, space to like get going. I'm not sure mm. if you understand what I mean. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm missing the words, here. but it's like yeah. maybe while you're would, preparing. Yeah. yeah, I would say it'd be one step back, two steps forward. Yeah, because you reflect on what you learned from that slip, so that you can not repeat it in the future if you if you prepare well enough. Yeah. Um, okay, so now I think. Like I mentioned before, it's important, or like you mentioned, um, to know at what stage somebody is. And then at each stage, there are different techniques or methods to help the person progress to the next one. So this is, um, you call it the principles of change. Could you maybe explain what the principles of change are and how you um, came up with them? Well, uh, in our early work, um, because we knew that uh, 
a lot of psychotherapies, which has to limit a small number of the population. Um, we went out and, and uh, studied uh, some people in Rhode Island that lived like in the backwoods. Who were uh, smokers who quit on their own. Right, right. Mm. And what was good was the uh, newspaper picked up on that. And uh, we would ask them about a principle, you know, like, um, did you become aware of, of uh, you know, smoking as a you know, threat? Uh, uh, are you aware of all the benefits that could come from it? Because maybe not just for yourself, but your family or your friends. Uh, and so it's, uh, um, what I love was, it's folks in, in, in the swamps and in the woods that, uh, you know, we're teaching us. And they mm -hmm. taught, they taught uh, Jim and Carlo Di Clemente, who did the interviews, um, the stages of change, because they would say, well, when were, when were you thinking about all of the uh, benefits? And said, well, earlier, you know, when were you doing, getting rid of your ashtrays? Oh, that was later on when I mm -hmm. really decided I wanted to stop mm -hmm. and stop, you know, just worrying about it. So it, it they pointed out that there was different techniques or principles of change that people did at different times in their process of changing the quitting smoking. And it was the smoking that was easier to find the people to you know teach the, the psychologist Jim and Carlo what they had done. And so that's why smoking became the first behavior that was really looked at. Mm. Yeah. And and we said, uh-huh, you know, wow, never thought about that. And when we present to a professional audience, yeah, those who haven't learned about it, you know, will say the same thing. Ah, uh -huh, how come nobody ever taught me about that? Mm -hmm. I think in the book Systems of Psychotherapy, that's where you were seeing the different processes of change, the different techniques that different therapies use. Yeah. And so, and again, the importance of using different principles or processes of change at different stages to be better at facilitating the movement to the next stage. And, and part of that, I mean, a big part of the problem is, is that, uh, let's say in college, that uh, college, it's fragmented. It's, uh, you have all different kinds of uh, uh, things and who pulls that you know, together? Well, in psychotherapy, uh, as I remember it, people from NIH published that there were like 300 psychotherapies. Mm. What a fragmentation, you know, what do professionals uh, do? And then what was found is that in the earlier stages, you use more of the thinking kinds of processes of change, reevaluating yourself, looking at your, the impact of your behavior on those around you thinking uh, emotionally, what would happen if I don't change? And what will happen if I did change to the healthier behavior? And raising consciousness, like learning about the behavior and what it does to your body and, and in turn, you know, motivating you through the thinking processes. And then in the later stages, the preparation action maintenance is more the behavioral processes of stimulus control, throwing out the ashtrays, mm. uh, getting supportive help from AA groups or um, your social media, uh, giving your, yourself rewards at a girl, you're doing a good job. Or mm. now that I'm exercising and lost a couple of pounds, I can buy a new sweatshirt. Uh, those kinds of things are more behaviorally and used in the later stages of changes, processes of change. Mm -hmm. uh, one example is I, I had a patient who uh, came to see me uh, for therapy and was in AA. And he just really took to what you know, we were sharing. And he, he ended up sending me all these people from AA. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good sign. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so maybe I share my little story of how I stopped smoking and maybe you can tell me if I used uh, some principles of change uh, sub or unconsciously. Um, so yeah, I smoked like from, I, th I think, 14 to 19 years old and pretty heavily, actually. Mm -hmm. And then uh, maybe I tried two or three times, but not seriously to stop and it never worked out. But then um, I did it cold turkey and um, it worked out. And I think looking back, there are two main factors that really 
the one motivating me and the other one being a reason why I was successful in maintenance. So what motivated me, if I look back, is I had this thought of those very rich tobacco industry managers laughing at me <laughs> for, you know, putting all this money in something that's just poison and putting this poison into my body. And I felt really angry at like just thinking of that. I mean, of course, it wasn't like literally uh, happening that somebody was thinking about me but just thinking of this like I, I thought to myself I'm not fooling or letting me fooled by by those tobacco industry people any longer and this anger I think really helped me to to like be motivated and then um, I actually went to the United States around abroad and in my hometown like everybody from my friend uh, of my friends were smoking and I thought, okay, let's, I, I will go to the United States, everything will be exciting, new environment and so on. And maybe now is the time to, to, uh, to really try stop smoking. And it worked. And I had just a couple of friends who were smoking in the United States. But yeah, it worked out. And I think th those were, were two reasons why I was successful. Maybe you can comment on that. I would say in the beginning, you were using your emotions to motivate you to change. And that's part of dramatic relief. Mm. And then later in the United States, you were changing your environment by stimulus control and using a different social group to be connected with, to make it easier for you to not go back to smoking. But I, I also really like uh, the anger that you had towards <laughs> the crack <home> industry. <laughs> mm. So, it, you know, uh, symbolically, it wasn't just for you that mm -hmm. you wanted to change. You wanted to, you know, get the tobacco industry out of the picture. Yeah. And that technique is used with youth sometimes around smoking cessation. But look, look who you're facilitating with your your money. You know, big mm -hmm. tobacco company. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now, I would like to ask you. Um, you say that if you have like an unhealthy behavior that you don't want to do anymore, then you th say that it's important to have three healthy alternatives. And you say it's not one, it's not two, it's not four or more. It really is three. How did you come up with uh, this figure? Well, what's interesting is it, it came from uh, uh, sales uh, people where you would try to get the uh, customer down to three choices. Because mm -hmm. otherwise you've got, you know, 10 choices, 20 choices. Mm -hmm. and that's just overwhelming. And so uh, if you uh, really narrow that, then it's much easier to make a choice. Of, oh, you could use all three of them. Yeah. But yeah, three is optimal for decision making. So that just helps to focus the person. Yeah, and it really makes sense because I think we all know the feeling of going to the supermarket and stand in for, front of a ch shelf with like 20, 30 different toothpaste or something. And right. like, it's too hard to go through pros and cons for each of them. So I really like this um, pragmatic uh, advice of three choices. Um, okay, so what about, as, as I said, I'm going to psychotherapy. What about... Um, the stages of change model for um, treating like classical mental disorders like anxiety disorders or depression is there any data um, showing that it's successful um, has it been applied or yeah with this with specifically with depression we owned a company called pro change behavior systems and then sold it about six years ago to the two lead staff and it still exists in the in the united states and one of the PhDs really focused in on depression prevention or, or, or depression treatment. And she, with others, built a online intervention for depression. And to be in action, one would be um, talking with others, whether it was a therapist or friend, it would be uh, taking medication if so prescribed on a regular basis. It would be exercising to uh, reduce stress and to get uh, the juices going. Mm. And, and uh, that intervention was quite successful. And if you went on 
the ProChanges website. You could learn more about it. It's www.prochange.com. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I know that one of Jim's students applied it to anxiety disorders. Uh, so it has been applied to more uh, mental health kinds of situations as well. Well, I would say one of the things that we haven't uh, written about, um, but there's a really good evidence, is that the, the behaviors, uh, the biggest risk for health, you know, smoking, uh, uh, alcohol abuse, unhealthy eating, et cetera, mm. uh, that those are the same behaviors that strengthen our immune system. Mm-hmm. So in the time of pandemic epidemic, mm. you know, all of the, like the uh, Center for uh, you know, Disease Control, it's like six feet apart, wear your mask, stay, stay quarantined. Mm. It, it doesn't you know, really share with them. Look at these are behaviors that you know, can really help you with uh, um, being at that's my best yeah. at risk. Uh, and while affecting other, uh, you know, kinds of preventing and managing chronic diseases. Yeah, and I think it um, like ties back what, what we said in the beginning that there are so many um, different benefits um, related to healthy eating and doing exercise and so on, and like getting a better immune system is one of them. So, and it's just one of them. <laughs> Um, it's pretty pretty um, amazing how much it can um, influence. Um, yeah, so um, you also talk in the book about uh, more positive things like positive emotions, purpose, and well-being. Um, because in part that's why it's called changing changing to thrive. And you draw on some people from the positive psychology movement, like Barbara Fredrickson. And um, yeah, Janice, I wanted to ask you, um, you have this little nice habit um, before you fall asleep or try to uh, fall asleep. um, Could you maybe share that? Because I'm doing it now for a week now too. (laughs) I got inspired actually. And how is it working for you? Um, I like it. Uh, Actually, it's like really counting sheep because I get to like the third or fourth (laughs) and then I'm... Yeah, I, I don't remember yeah. anything, <laughs> but it, it's yes. good. It's good too. <laughs> it's good if you've had a good day, you only get to three or four. That's true. Yeah. Um, yes, I really like uh, her positivity book, Barbara Fredrickson's, and she's a psychologist. And the, those 10 things that she reflects on that really help well being are joy, gratitude, uh, learning something new, relaxing awe, inspiration, laughter, pride, and love. And what what you can do with those 10 things is also to reflect on, am I getting it? Oh, I don't have anything with laughter today. I'll have to work on something tomorrow that that Mm. brings me more laughter. Or I really didn't learn anything new today. I'll have to look tomorrow to see if I can make that happen in some way. Or I, when I've taught this to others, someone said, well, I don't have enough awe in my life, so I'm driving a different way to work because I know I'm going to see the ocean. And that yeah. always gives me awe. Uh, and, and just to throw this out too, those 10 kinds of things, I've worked with some nonprofits to say, are, are you providing your, your users those 10 kinds of things in some way to make it a real benefit to be in your nonprofit, whether it's, it's a congregation church or it's a Longwood Gardens. And it's just interesting way of uh, showing how those 10 kinds of things are important to people in their lives. And if you are helping make those happen for others, it makes you more successful as an organization. Mm. Yeah. Okay, I, I would just add in terms of on the uh, happiness side, mm. uh, too many people, uh, certainly in the US, don't leave enough time for playing. You know, Mm. time gets eaten up by work and uh, uh, being, you know, playing, uh, I'm playing the best golf I've ever played. Mm -hmm. Uh, Janice is playing really good tennis. Uh, I do uh, exercise bike uh, and go about six miles almost each day. 
and it's uh, playing with ideas is also what I love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny. I actually wanted to ask you about your favorite hobbies. Uh, <laughs> so yes. you're just mentioning some nice things. I, I guess the, these are um, your hobbies. Um, Janice, do you also? Um, he, he mentioned tennis. Uh, what are you? Uh, what else are you doing? Uh, I love reading literary novels and being part of book clubs, and mm -hmm. also going to the theater, especially for with drama dramatic pieces, so that you get stimulated and learn something new. Nice. Yeah. We also appreciate the U.S. that uh, television has brought on some really good talents to uh, with comedy, you know, to on yeah. the streaming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I like that to go uh, before we go to bed. The drama or tragedies, I, I value probably even more. Mm -hmm. Being a psychologist. But I don't want to <laughs> think about that when I'm going to bed. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, you got to so. think about joy, gratitude. Right, right. <laughs> that, I can recommend that. That's a good way to fall asleep. Um, okay, so my last question I always want to ask is, um, if you could travel back in time to your younger self, um, who just grad graduated high school, what career and or life advice would you give to him or her? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, at that age, uh, youngsters don't know what they, you know. But it's to yourself. What, what would you have given to yourself advice? Well, I mean, same for myself. Mm. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I went to a liberal arts college where you get a you know, t taste of all different types of things. Um, I wish I had learned from others. I did finally when I was, uh, you know, pretty early on, uh, learning about what's my passion, okay? Mm. What do I most want to be doing? And uh, follow my passion. And there is, uh, unfortunately, uh, in the U.S., there's a majority of people who really don't like their work. Mm. But they have to do it. Uh, And so then we would really be recommending avocation, golfing, mm -hmm. tennis, uh, playing games, uh, going for hikes, travel. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, when we talked about this yesterday, Jim was also saying he wished he hadn't gone to such a conservative uh, liberal arts college. Mm. It wasn't liberal, it was conservative. <laughs> conservative, <laughs> okay. That's yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. I mean, it was Muskingum College where he was being groomed in a sense to become a Presbyterian minister. Mm. But, okay. uh, and I was on scholarship and I started up a socialist club mm -hmm. uh, on campus. Mm. And then I started up a Newman's club, which is for Catholic students. And the dean called me in and said, Jim, I'm, I don't think this is the right place for you. Oh, okay. <laughs> so then you uh, dropped out or did you follow through? <laughs> well, what, what I did was uh, uh, I decided to go hitchhiking around the country mm. so I could learn more about myself and my society. Mm -hmm. and, and that was such a you know, really great growth uh, experience. I bet. What about you, Janice? Well, um, I'm I took you literally, what advice would you give mm -hmm. yourself? And when I was graduating from high school, I would make sure that I would go bowling on a Saturday night with my girlfriend so that I would see Jim again at the bowling alley. <laughs> I knew who he was in high school, but we never dated in high school. Ah, okay. And it was by chance that I went bowling and we're, I'm Polish background and in Polish people often have bowling leagues. Mm -hmm. At least my parents did. And uh, anyways, so that's where we met up again uh, when I saw him there at the bowling alley and he called me in. Anyways. That's sweet. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> okay. So when, I, yeah. when I was traveling, uh, I was going to go for uh, two semesters. Mm -hmm. And uh, after one semester, I decided, okay, now I'm in a stage where I'm ready for intimacy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. That's nice that you're um, 
it again ties back to the stages and you really have to know on what stage you are right mm -hmm. yeah okay janice and james prochaska um thank you so much for taking your time it was a real pleasure and also thank you for really your whole work on this whole um, stages of change model and i really bet you have helped so many people get help uh, happier and healthier lives and yeah so thank you so much thank you thank too you. for asking us i hope you enjoyed our conversation about the stages of change model and the book changing to thrive i really recommend reading the book because there are so many more details about how you change and what you can do to prevent um, falling back or stepping back or slipping and um, there are so many exercises in there that will help you develop um, strategies and techniques to be able to well first get ready are ready plan do and don't um, slip And even if you slip, take, there are techniques um, to go back on track. And like we said, on each stage, there are different techniques. And if you know them, you really feel prepared to manage or change any behavior you want. Um, so I really recommend reading their book. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. And if you liked it, uh, then please um, give me or the video a like and subscribe to this channel because then I'll be encouraged to ask many more leading scientists from different fields. And yeah, so I hope to see you next time.